Deutsche Bahn is the biggest state company. We are in the areas of passenger transportation and freight transportation. I think the biggest challenge for us is to really explain that technology doesn't mean that we take someone's job away. Most of our staff is out in the operations. They take a lot of pride in that work. We say this is a new solution. It doesn't mean that how you do things today will disappear, but we just do it in a different way. And we show you right away what this means. And you can also um, participate and say what works and what doesn't. I spend most of my time currently really into um, looking how digitalization can help the business rather than um, how can we take care of the legacy. I mean, yes, it's a very necessary thing to do, but my heart is more on the digital side and really looking what does the business needs and how can we help them. This is Siona TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Arlene Bühler, who is the CIO and CDO at uh, DB Cargo. A very warm welcome, Arlene. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Arlene, you have a master in business administration and in computer science from the Berlin University for Applied Sciences. Uh, you started your career in IT consulting in 98 uh, with Siemens, and you worked in other consulting companies around the world, in Canada, Philippines. And 14, you took an IT leadership role at Volkswagen. And in 2020, you joined the uh, Deutsche Bahn CIO office. And then in 2021, you were appointed CIO and CDO here at DB Cargo, where we are today in the mines headquarters. So um, Arlene, tell us a little bit more about yourself. What's your background? Who are you really? And how did you um, end up in this position here? First things first, I am 45 years old, mm -hmm. happily married with two wonderful daughters. They are 15 and 17. Mm -hmm. And we as a family are very international. And that also defines my career. Um, I was born in the Philippines, mm -hmm. but was raised in Germany. And my husband originally came, comes from the Netherlands with a Canadian uh, passport. Mm -hmm. And our first child was born in New York in the United States and our second child in Manila. And that was basically always the place where we stopped for a career. Mm -hmm. So coming to IT, um, my passion for IT started as early as uh, in my teenage years. I was 16 years old when my father first uh, gave me a laptop mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed technology from that beginning uh, onwards. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to start um, a dual um, study program with Siemens, as you just mentioned. And within the study program, we were exposed already to a lot of foreign uh, countries. So one of the um, countries that I was able to do an internship in was Singapore. Mm -hmm. And that was essentially also where later on my career started. But before that, I was also in Madrid and in, in Spain and uh, wrote my thesis paper there. Also, found a complete love for the Spanish language, which I later backed up for um, a two-month stint in Buenos Aires to also learn a little bit more about the culture and uh, also about the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, from Singapore onwards, where I first had my assignment with Siemens, um, I had the fantastic opportunity to learn a lot about the culture, but also how IT was developing in Asia. Mm -hmm. We were in the regional headquarters in uh, Singapore, but we took care of 14 countries, all the way to Australia, but also Japan and um, also um, Indonesia mm -hmm. and, and Thailand. And the role there was, uh, as you also mentioned, very much in a consulting role. See how we can leverage IT to improve the business and to improve the operating companies. And I really enjoyed that time. And after that, after close to two years, uh, I had a chance to go with my, my husband to New York. That's where later on also <laughs> our first daughter was born. And in New York, we were both working for Siemens. Mm -hmm. And um, there I changed a little bit, um, still in the IT, but went more into an auditing role mm -hmm. and spent a lot of time in, in looking into factories, how factories were automated, but also also very much um, how ERP is influencing uh, business processes, automating. So we were very much focused on um, SAP mm -hmm. and we stayed there for two years. And then we decided to make a complete uh, change because our first daughter was born and we decided we always wanted to both be entrepreneurs and then went to Manila. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. for four years and started several companies. I'm, I'm coming to that later. Not yeah. everything <laughs> went really well, but it was mm -hmm. a very exciting time because our second daughter was born. So what defines me is also very much family and, and finding a good balance. Mm -hmm. And after four years in the, in the Philippines, we uh, came to the conclusion, mm, um, my husband is Canadian, why not Canada? Oh, yeah. We moved to Toronto, <laughs> which was also a fantastic time. Um, we were still entrepreneurial in, in Toronto, mm -hmm. really enjoyed the three years there. And then uh, Siemens called at one point of time and said, come back, come back. <laughs> and we have a cool project here, some European implementation mm -hmm. in Mexico, uh, would you want to join? And I did. And when I was then in the Canadian operations, the German colleagues called and said, we also have a very uh, good SIP program here. Um, would you not want to consider going back to uh, Germany? I lived 11 years with my family abroad and uh -huh. then we went to Munich. And then from Munich, um, I was lucky enough to get poached by, by Volkswagen, took their, um, the leadership role. It was head of IT of one of the um, subsidiaries uh, mm -hmm. in the real estate business. And from there, after five years, um, I had the fantastic opportunity to, jo to join German Railway. Mm -hmm. I always loved mobility as well. And um, I was there for nearly two years um, working with the group CIO, being responsible of the group IT portfolio management and performance management. Mm -hmm. And when the chance came um, to join one of the biggest businesses that um, German Railway had, that is DB Cargo, where we yep. are today, I uh, jumped at the opportunity and that's where I am today. Okay, quite a story and really international story. Yeah? Quite uh, amazing. So Deutsche Bahn, Give us a bit of a context and then add the national railways here in Germany and then DB Cargo. Can you also give there some numbers? How many people, um, how many, I mean, what kind of businesses that DB Cargo really does? Mm -hmm. So when we look at German Railway, Deutsche Bahn, this mm -hmm. is the biggest state company. Mm -hmm. um, we are in the areas of passenger transportation and freight transportation. Yeah. In um, Globally, we are more than 330,000. In <laughs> Germany, we are in total with all our 18 different business divisions, mm -hmm. uh, more than 200,000 employees. And um, we are also quite international. Yeah. It means um, we have one arm, DB Schenker, that is in uh, more than 70 countries and um, they do more um, rail uh, road uh, they do more road um, uh, freight yep. um, combination also with rail that's where we come into play um, obviously this is a sister company we work closely together uh, but db cargo specializes very much on um, rail freight yep. and db cargo is uh, the biggest uh, rail freight provider in all of europe okay. we are close to 31,000 uh, employees mm -hmm. and uh, in 18 countries 17 european and also in, in china and uh, our mission is be big, be bold, um, yeah. be powerful, be innovative. And uh, our mission is definitely to um, achieve to transfer more of the traffic on the road to rail yeah. and that um, doing it in, in a very innovative way using automation and digitalization. Okay, super. So big, big organization and cargo being a, a very, very important part of that. So you do a lot of containers, right? <laughs> not just containers, but yes. And, and uh, if uh, you may know or you may not, um, one train uh -huh. can actually replace 52 truckloads. So 52 containers. Mm -hmm. That's the leverage that we have. Okay. Now let's talk about business in general a little bit. I mean, we live in special times. There's uh, um, um, geopolitical instability, there's financial things are going on, inflation and so on. So we live in special times. What is the, what would you say here in DB Cargo is one of the most important business challenges that the, the organization is facing and, 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 and how does, um, how, how does it cope with that? Yes, we have two very important challenges right now we have mm -hmm. to tackle. One is capacity management. Mm -hmm. As I said before, we are part of German Railway. So we do share the same network. Mm -hmm. Transportation for passengers, um, the white trains or the red trains that mm -hmm. you very often see here, and us as DB Cargo, we share the same tracks and yeah. they're limited, okay. right? So we have about 30,000 kilometers in uh, Germany, just mm -hmm. in Germany alone. But as you can imagine, to, to build a track um, through dense cities, it's uh, it's a very difficult mm -hmm. a task and it takes years. So our um, challenge is here, how do we transfer more um, traffic from the street to the rail uh, without building 
And that is where automation and digitalization comes into play. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the biggest challenges that we're constantly working on. Yep. And the second is um, getting the people to um, join us because mm -hmm. we are not a company that is, that is um, very known for uh, IT, very known for technology mm -hmm. yet. So we're hoping to change this yep. by providing also a, a very good uh, mix of, of very good projects that we that help us to um, uh, achieve the higher capacity. Mm -hmm. And uh, also when we talk about um, people, then a lot of the, the people that we have today are leaving the company uh, mm -hmm. very soon. So we have a lot of manual processes. Mm -hmm. When you go to our yards, all the coupling um, of the wagons uh, takes place manually. And uh, also the um, uh, locomotives are driven still by people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this knowledge, a lot of the people stay very long. Yep. The German railway, 30, 40 years, and they're slowly leaving the company. And when you ask a young person, do you want to do the coupling by hand? Obviously, they say no. So we have to also find ways to create a better work environment yep. um, in a digital and automated way to, to also um, obtain uh, young colleagues that are joining us. Okay. So human resources is, is, a, is an, a priority, managing that and making sure that you have the right people at the right place. Um, and then optimizing the usage of the tracks is, a, is an important thing. But I, I'm, I'm guessing that also sustainability here is very high on the agenda in general of the business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm very proud to work for a company that mm -hmm. achieves uh, around 7 million tons of CO2 savings every single year. Mm -hmm. And when you compare it with uh, the trucking business, we as a rail uh, freight forward company, we basically save 80% compared to the, the truck traffic. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge numbers and this is definitely one of our purpose why we get up every day in the morning to yeah. increase that number, right? And um, when you look at the market share right now that we have in uh, Germany, it's only about 18%. And that is for us, it's, it's very low. Yeah. Because if you look at transportation in general, it accounts for 20% of CO2 emissions. Yeah. And the leverage that we would like to achieve is that once we can, not just freights, but also passengers, um, we can um, motivate people to use more our services. That also yeah. means a further reduction of CO2 emissions, obviously yeah. creating a sustainable future. And that's why the motto is now Güter gehören auf die Schiene. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> And that's something that uh, has been our slogan um, mm -hmm. already since the 60s. But unfortunately, the last couple of years, we saw more shift into uh, automotive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people wanted to basically um, drive their own car. At, but the same at the same time, this happened in the logistics area that yep. we see a lot more trucks on the road. Yep. Um, but the like the way to reduce CO2 emissions and, and create a sustainable future is making that shift. Yep. And also um, discussing with our clients on how to give access to this um, mode of transportation in a very easy way. And that's yep. where also digitalization comes in place, mm -hmm. um, where we provide our customers easy access via portals, but also um, very data-driven services like track and trace, where is your good. So in a way, what we do want and... Yeah, maybe that's a bit of a bold vision, but we would like to be as easy as an Amazon when yeah. you want to conduct business yeah. with us. So the more people we put on trains, the more freight we put on trains, the better for society and, 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 and climate. I mean, because it's, it's a way more optimal way to transport things and people. Um, but the challenge is to make it more accessible and more easy to use, more user friendly and so on. And so I can imagine that there's a lot of innovation and, and, and transformation going on in the company today. So, so let's talk about that. So digital innovation is what we, one of the topics that we want to discuss today. And then we were going to deep dive in uh, the, the role of artificial intelligence and, and enterprise automation in that. So let's talk about innovation maybe first as a process. So how uh, would you say that innovation in DB Cargo is, is organized? What is the, the uh, innovation model that you have here? How, who's responsible for it? How is it executed? Tell, tell me a little bit the big picture first. Mm -hmm. I've always been a big fan of business and IT fusion. Mm -hmm. you know, my background is I studied um, both um, informatics and business. Mm -hmm. And I always believe that our role as IT is twofold. 
for once to be an, a driver for innovation, to be an enabler. Mm -hmm. And very often also um, giving the impulses to the business, how they can improve their, their processes. Yep. At the same time, obviously also is um, creating more cost efficient um, mm -hmm. processes. So, so these two um, don't contradict each other in, yep. in my opinion. So what we have done, and I've been in this role now for one and a half years, is that we focus very much on establishing an, an, establishing, um, an organization that fosters this close communication and collaboration between mm -hmm. business and IT. And the way we do it is creating um, more communities, um, generating ideas ourselves as an IT, but also listening very much to our business uh, partners and seeing what their challenges are, mm -hmm. and also let them come uh, up with ideas that we then match with technology solutions. So we created um, a whole new department that's called Innovation and Transformation okay. that um, has been in place since, since last summer. Mm -hmm. And within that uh, department, we have another team that has newly been established that takes care of um, ecosystems and partnerships. I also, I'm also a believer that we should not reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good practices from our competition, but also from our partners. And I'm also a very big fan of co-creation. So we're looking um, into what, are our, what is our competition uh, doing, not just other rail freight companies, but some other logistics companies. And how are they convincing their clients? So getting into dialogue with them, um, but also asking very much our customers, what yep. is your pressing issue? And then coming up with common solutions. So that's, that's uh, in a way how I see um, the success of innovation. That's what we are currently establishing at DB Cargo. Okay. So you have a separate, in, in the IT uh, space, you have a separate team for innovation and transformation. Yes. Okay. And so how, how is that organized? How, I mean, this, you, they, they need to collaborate with business units, they need to collaborate with, with clients, uh, such as DHL, and I can imagine that kind of, of companies that you work with. How does that work on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. So within this um, department, as I just said, we have ecosystems and partnerships, mm -hmm. and another one is um, data intelligence and analytics. Okay. Because we would like to become uh, much more of a data-driven uh, company. Mm -hmm. And what we do is um, that every year when we do our planning, um, we're a big holding, we're a big corporation. We also yeah. have then very traditional planning processes. Mm -hmm. um, we scan very much all the ideas that are coming in mm -hmm. and uh, then also looking into what is the investment, what is the opportunity, what is the benefit, yeah. and then also um, make a selection of, um, and, I, and I really like this picture of a portfolio mixer, mm -hmm. not having everything that is um, related to cost reduction, but also um, allocating budget to innovative ideas. So we mm -hmm. call it like a transform uh, uh, budget yeah? okay. or like a grow budget. And that's where we then also um, discuss with all um, business stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, where do you want to go in the future? What is your, um, What are your strategic drivers and how is IT digitalization helping you to achieve this? And then we basically move backwards and say, okay, we have these programs in place. Yep. In best case, they're end to end. They're not just tackle, um, for instance, just sales, but also has an impact on, on production. Mm -hmm. And then we also um, provide um, solutions. We call them platforms where we can also say, okay, that particular um, problem or that particular process can fit into our platform. Yep. And platform can be anything from cloud, but also very functional like SAP mm -hmm. or Salesforce. And that's how we uh, do it in a more community-based uh, approach where we try to also um, explain to our business partners how technology can, uh, can change yep. their processes, but then also listen to them when they say, um, maybe here I need a more individual solution. So it's very much a dialogue how we do it. Okay. So two teams in there, one around data analytics, one around the ecosystem. Could we maybe pick an example of, of, of both of these uh, areas uh, of, 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 uh, of, of a program that has been implemented and the kind of results that come out of that? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can start with the data or with the... With yeah, um, data is it's, it's, uh, my favorite topic, but also <laughs> <laughs> my most challenging topic. Okay. We are, we are a huge organization and mm -hmm. we are in 18 countries and uh, just in uh, Germany alone, we're close to 20,000 people. Yep. And we have very different locations, right? And we do intermodal, so we um, also have very different modes of... Um, transport ways and our clients always want to know where the goods are and yeah. we have to be able um, to tell it to them because they are, have their production plan. 
So one of our challenges has been, and then they are still at it, to really focus on data quality. Mm -hmm. I know it's not a very sexy, uh, but very important. yeah, but very very important. And yeah. uh, also when when um, colleagues are saying telling me, oh, let's do AI and everything. Yes, it's very important, but we have to do our homework first. Yeah. So so one of the things that the team has established was a data lake mm -hmm. where they uh, used also a very modern platform. Um, but more than more than the technology, they explain to the business why it's important mm -hmm. to um, bring their data, their applications into the data lakes and to harmonize it so that at the end of the day, we have the same common language to yeah. then develop um, data-driven services. It's an ongoing battle. Mm -hmm. Slowly but surely, we're also convincing our colleagues that yeah. they should give up their access databases, Excel, uh -huh. but also their self-developed um, other data tools and uh, that has been quite a success mm -hmm. so we can leverage right, right now to work more on in my opinion more interesting topics like AI for instance mm -hmm. that is uh, one of the topics that the team worked on and the second team is very much uh, scanning the market and, and looking into uh, what standard platforms we can use so what we did in, um, in the last two years is for instance bringing a new uh, CRM Salesforce or Salesforce platform or CRM mm -hmm. platform in, and also not using it as um, just the CRM solutions, but also looking into what other functionalities um, can we leverage for yeah. our business processes. And there's stuff like integration, um, like they have a great integration layer, but also very much focusing on um, customer communication, uh, customer service. Yeah. And that's something where we try to also leverage the tools that we have mm -hmm. And somehow also more take the approach to adapt our current processes to the system rather than the other way around. Okay. Um, you also uh, talked about co-creation with, with clients. Can you give an example of, of a program that, that works in that area? Yes, it's um, um, a team that we have in Duisburg. In Duisburg, we have our control tower and uh, the team there has come up with a, they call it link to rail platform, mm -hmm. which is a platform that enables our clients to make online orders um, when they would like to uh, purchase space to transport their mm -hmm. goods. And um, this team over there has set up also um, a customer service center where they invite clients and basically discuss what you need so some of the services that came out yeah. that was co-developed was basically track and trace or um, with one, of, one of my favorite use cases is that they came up with a solution where they can um, scan all the um, uh, the metal uh, scrap mm -hmm. that they can actually go via camera over and the camera detects if it's good or not so good scrap. Mm -hmm. So that in, in, um, we talked about people that uh, they don't want to do the manual work anymore. So in the past, somebody had to go and look and um, make a judgment if it's good scrap or not. Mm -hmm. And this now we can do via technology. And that was a service that was uh, co-developed with a client. Yeah. It actually also won one of the logistics uh, prizes, I think, two years ago. Okay. So a lot of innovation had to be done because like you said, your dream is really to have an Amazon-like interface where a client can say, I, I need 20 containers from here to there at that moment, and I can track and trace where they are and, and being delivered. Is that That's the level of, of user friendliness that, you want to, that you're aiming at, right? Absolutely, because uh -huh. that's the only way, I think, and how we can also increase the interest and also our market mm -hmm. share by making it very easy. Yeah, okay. Now, DB Cargo is, a, like you said, a big company, a very traditional company, uh, a, a, I would say a very engineer's driven company. So, um, so I can imagine that innovation is not always easy in an environment like this. So, so how would you, what would you describe as the biggest challenges to accelerate innovation and how are you handling the, uh, this? I think the biggest challenge for us is to really explain that technology doesn't mean that we take someone's job away, mm -hmm. right? Most of our um, staff is out in the operation and they take a lot of pride in that work. That's why we focus a lot on transformation, being really out there, out in the field, observing mm -hmm. and asking them, how can we improve their um, life? Yeah. Because everybody 
at home has a phone and has technology and it's more a question um, how can you take that knowledge of handling um, things at your home uh, also in your operations and that's what we do we um, sit together with them and then also discuss with them how it can be approved involve them and then when we have come up with a solution also show it to them immediately and then it's more like a like a rapid development process mm -hmm. where we basically show them on the system yep. right now what we're doing. So we have a, a big project right now um, where we are um, modernizing all our planning processes. Mm -hmm. We're using also a platform here and there the goal is to take 10 existing planning systems to move it into one platform. Mm -hmm. And that's most, mostly also out in the operations and that's where we apply this methodology where we say this is the new solution it doesn't mean that um what you do to how you do things today will disappear but we just do it in a different way and we show you right away what this means and you can also um, participate and say what works and what doesn't and i i think this has proven to us more successful than just defining everything on a corporate level and then just dumping it okay arlene artificial intelligence has become a major game changer right and, and how we can innovate with, with, with technology. Uh, so I'm sure that also here, you're looking at this, you're trying it out. Can you tell me a little bit where you are uh, and, and what your vision is on using AI here at TP Cargo? Mm -hmm. Definitely a huge potential here, mm -hmm. since we talked a lot about manual processes and yep. we put quite a bit of effort in data quality and mm -hmm. we're continuing to do this. And so in total, we see um, various areas where we um, are also putting the first steps in place. Mm -hmm. So one of it is um, maintenance, where we basically, um, and that's, a, that's a, a very recent example where we put um, camera bridges on our yards. Mm -hmm. So when you have single wagon, we call it single wagon traffic, basically what it means that you put different wagons together, they go to different clients and um, you have to put them together. Um, and that can be two or three freight wagons or, or more to create one full train. Mm -hmm. And um, the way you do it, you do it on the yard and then uh, basically it gets put together and we install camera bridges. Um, it goes through the camera bridge and the camera bridge takes a lot of pictures and sees if there's any damage on that on that on, on any of the wagons mm -hmm. right and if you uh, look into numbers currently or in the past there was um, one of our colleagues that had to check the train at 740 meters that he had to walk up and down to check for damages yep. now with the camera bridges and we have nine of them installed that gets uh, done automatically mm -hmm. but obviously now we have millions of pictures <laughs> and for a human eye to now scan through every that that is uh, close to impossible so there we are trying out now the possibility of ai mm -hmm. and um, are in, in the process of creating um, an algorithm that can actually detect um, yep. Uh, all, all the damages. And in the past, it meant to train um, the algorithm to also say, what is, um, how does a um, wagon perfectly look like and what are kind of damages so that then um, a colleague can basically get or gets an alert mm -hmm. and sits in front of a computer, gets an alert, um, and then can actually go check and um, basically then also say what needs to be done. And in most cases, we can send it then to the maintenance. So that is something that is already in existence. Is the algorithm 100%? No, we're working on it, yep. but we have established a very good basis. Okay. So that's a very nice example of, I would say, computer vision and artificial intelligence based on, 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 on images to see if, if uh, there's damages. There's other examples as well, I, uh, I imagine. Yeah, so we do also have invested quite a lot, uh, a lot in um, IoT. Mm -hmm. And uh, also when you look at, um, at the interior of a wagon, we do transport all kinds of goods and materials. So what is very important is that um, when the wagon um, is on the tracks, that it's a smooth runway because every time there is um, like a bump in the road, it might affect the goods. Okay. So that is one of the use cases. Or the second one is temperature, right? We also transport um, uh, 
all kinds of uh, food. Yeah. And there we need to um, find uh, the perfect temperature. There also, that's a use case right now we're looking at, um, where artificial intelligence can also help us in terms of um, obtaining data if um, there's any variation in temperature drop or in terms of, of the weightage or yeah. any kinds of bumps that are coming. So that is something also, not live yet, but one of the research areas we're looking okay. at and how, how that can help us. Because we have more than three 3,600 trains uh, a day running. So you can imagine um, that most of the time everything goes well, but yeah. at some days uh, also or some tracks may not be in the best shape. And that gives us also some leverage in, in obtaining the data. Okay. And so the, like you, you told earlier about your data team and being very busy with uh, quality of data, uh, building the data lake and so on. So the further you are in that, the more opportunities there are to, to put the AI programs on top of it, right? Yes, and from an organization point of view, we also have um, a central organization um, that I'm in charge of, but we also have some, some decentralized IT, mm -hmm. um, a team um, basically that is very close to the production. Okay. And they know um, the people, they know the, the processes, and they also come up with a lot of their use cases, the ones that I just um, described yep. were basically coming from the production IT team. But we do work very closely together and also integrating the data in our data lake so mm -hmm. that we can utilize um, this data not just for production but at the same time then also leverage it when we communicate with our clients because at the end of the day all that information has to come to, to yep. our clients. And is, do you have a what I would call an, an AI strategy and, and, and how do you make sure that you have the right people on board? I mean finding data scientists in general is, is quite a challenge and, and, and I can imagine in, in DB Cargo uh, also not, not easy so is that something that you want to have in-house or something that you work with, I don't know, universities or with consulting companies? What's overall the AI strategy here? Mm -hmm. So I would maybe take a step back and say, uh, first of all, we, we have a data strategy where we very much focus on the data quality, but also setting up an organization, a data governance organization, mm -hmm. where we also continuously explain why it's important to um, create and obtain uh, good data quality within the different departments. Yeah. And that should always be the first priority before we talk about other services. We do have an AI strategy on the group level mm -hmm. where we're tapping in. So recently on group level was an AI factory um, established where we can also um, obtain resources because we are all looking at very scarce <laughs> resources right now. But what uh, the model is that every um, business division and or every um, um, unit of, of German Railway mm -hmm. can also bring in the use cases and then we see if we have uh, the same use cases in in different divisions at uh, uh, German Railway and then work together and then synergize on yeah. on on the um, on the on the resources that we have in AI. So the AI factory is on Deutsche Bahn level? Or? Yes, it's ah, on Deutsche okay. Bahn level but we are, as a community, as the CEOs of the divisions, are also tapping into this. We bring the use cases and uh, we can obtain the resources from that AI factory. Okay, super. Now, Arlene, we're living at, I think, a, a, almost like a tipping point at the AI with all the generative AI that's coming up with GPT and Midjourney and, uh, and, and all that. What is your view on this? Do you see use cases of, of generative AI here at DB Cargo as well? Yes, absolutely. That's something we as a community look at into mm -hmm. and specifically for, for DB Cargo, um, we are operating in 17 operating countries mm -hmm. and by legislation is that every time one of our trains crosses a border, we need to exchange the train conductor and the train conductor has to speak the language of the country he's operating in. So I think that's where um, something like ChatGPT can play a major role. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have already um, uh, translation tools in place, but mm -hmm. here it comes more like what kind of documentation is needed, what kind of legislation is in that, in that country needed. No. Uh, currently, this is all done with lots of manual documents at the border crossing. No. Um, and that would be one of the game changes to, to absolutely reduce also the time we need to exchange um, the, the border crossing and, and the exchange of, of data information. Yeah. So that is uh, one of the, the use cases we also brought forward and that we're looking uh, at currently. Yeah. 
I can imagine that you work a lot with other countries uh, around Europe as well, with the French and with the Belgians and, and, and the Dutch and so on. So how is that collaboration going on on, on, on IT level? So we do have um, a consortium built up. It's called mm -hmm. Rail Freight Forward. Mm -hmm. That was um, um, founded by um, the cargo business of the Austrian um, freight company. And um, in, within the, this um, consortium are, are five topics that all European um, freight companies or in, that are in the rail mm -hmm. uh, business uh, deem important. So one is digital automatic coupling. It's basically um, automatically putting the wagons together okay. and not doing it in, in a manual way. Um, one topic is uh, automated train operation. Um, where we can also see that we as, as a European community can push it because as you imagine it's uh, significant funding um, mm -hmm. needed for, for both of the initiatives. Yeah. Um, one other thing is also capacity management on European level, which is also for us a very, very important topic yeah. here in Germany. Um, another one is also to create um, uh, European standards um, on, on the train management system. And last uh, one that uh, we also feel quite important uh, um, is um, digital platform, that we create data standards across Europe, that um, when we cross borders, we have the same um, kinds of documentation in place, mm -hmm. that we have the same kind of data that we can also leverage for services. And that's something that we as uh, German Railway or DB Cargo are working quite closely together with. Uh, so one of the main drivers are um, Austria and uh, also um, France. But we also um, work very much um, on innovation in general mm -hmm. in, in pushing the sector the um, railway sector um, making it as i said earlier already accessible for the clients to use our services okay so we will have in the future self-driving trains then we do we do have that today oh, already, actually oh, yeah. and not like freight trains mm -hmm. but we have examples um for passengers it's um it's like an s-bahn um, more in in, uh, in the city city of Hamburg, we have uh, the first pilot now for okay. for an automated um, S bahn, and the same technology we are um, now applying at DB Cargo. So we are one of the pilots that's mm -hmm. also funded by the European Commission. But obviously, that still needs um, a little bit of time to develop um, yeah. in terms of legislation what that means. Yeah, I like Elon Musk has a dream that we all have self driving cars somewhere in the future. We'll have a future. We'll have a a big fleet of self-driving trains then as well. Yes, but then also still, you need still the train conductor there, but uh, yeah, but that's definitely uh, the goal. Uh, uh, still a lot of automation and, and uh, innovation to be done. There's uh, lots of opportunities. A third topic I would love uh, to discuss with you, Arlene, is, uh, is intelligent automation. I mean, RPA, software robots, low code and, and, and so on are, have, are, is an amazing trend. Uh, that we see in, uh, in IT in general. So where are you in, in, in your process of implementing RPA and, and, and robot software robots here at DB Cargo? To be honest, we are at the beginning stages. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something that uh, we definitely have a look at mm -hmm. at this point of time, but we are, to be honest, still uh, very much focused on looking at our legacy and, and uh, um, in the process of modernizing our legacy. Mm -hmm. For example, our production system we call um, uh, at a, in a production a production system when we put all the trains together and this system has been more than 30 years old mm -hmm. and if you look at the um, if you look at the interface then it looks like from the from, from the 30. 90s yeah <laughs> like um, black screen with like uh, green Characters, arrows yeah, uh, yeah. exactly so that is something that we are focusing very much on and um, the whole automation within IT it's something where we more look into uh, platforms so, mm -hmm. so we have um, one company that has implemented a low code platform mm -hmm. Um, they are very happy with it. That's a company that basically provides the access to the to the ports. Um, 
talks with the ports and gets the containers um, from the ports then yep. onto our our um, freight wagons. Yep. So that is something that uh, we have successfully implemented. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of RPA, that is something in the near future, but not something that, yep. that we are currently uh, focusing on yep. right now. Because I can imagine there's still so many documents, so many different systems where you have to exchange data between the different systems, so many legacy systems that you need to uh, to transform and in that transformation process there's i mean there must be huge opportunities uh, in in that as well are you establishing a, a center of excellence for automation is that is that a, one of the plans as well that's some of the plans so when i talk that we are not currently focusing on mm -hmm. that's more from a central perspective from yep. a dbag but we do have um, some of our countries that are very venturing out and what we are thinking of is that not everything has to come from from germany but we should also leverage the know-how of our for instance, French uh, colleagues or British colleagues, and they are in some ways already further and have implemented some of the automation already there. And we're looking into how we can maybe set up a competence center yep. outside of Germany and leveraging that know-how. Okay, super. Arlene, let's talk a little bit more about your IT organization. Uh, I understand that if we calculate all the externals, uh, external people that work that we ha you have around, uh, a team of around 1,000 people, is that correct? Um, around about, yes. If you yeah. look at everybody that has something to do with IT, mm -hmm. being within our organization, that's around 250 plus. Then yeah. you have still quite a decentralized organization that is also about yeah. 250 plus, including the countries. And yeah. then we have about 300 plus more or less um, external um, IT colleagues that are helping us. Yeah. So round about between 900 and 1,000 that, okay. that are actually helping us driving innovation. Okay. So Arlene, tell me a little bit uh, more about how you have organized these, these close to 1,000 people. What's the, what's the IT operating model? We are um, also focusing here very much on, on a more um, community approach, mm -hmm. meaning we have countries we have 17 countries plus China, and obviously, especially these 17 countries in Europe have also their own IT organization. Mm -hmm. um, but we do um, have regular um, community meetings, um, and not just very generic what is strategy, but we're starting now to build, for instance, an innovation community where we can specifically look into what kind of innovations are done in, in the country and how can we leverage it. The same we have for all our infrastructure topics. So um, every couple of weeks, all IT managers from the countries are coming together and then they're discussing what their challenges are and we are also telling them what um, the newest um, services we can offer. And when I say we, that includes our internal digital partner. It's called DB Sestel and they are basically in charge of um, providing IT services to all of DB. Okay. So um, the 300 um, external um, IT a staff that, that um, we have currently within DB Cargo, the majority is coming from oh, yeah. DB Sistel. So there we also have a very um, modern approach of working together mm -hmm. where we basically um, use their way of um, more a product oriented IT. Um, something that we would like to implement. For instance, we are currently um, developing all our sales processes further. Mm -hmm. And there we are in talks, not just with the business, but also with DB Sister to come up with a joint product team where it's not about um, you're the service provider or you're the business on your IT, but yeah. actually working together as a team. So that is yeah. something that in the future we would like to organize. Are we there yet? Not. Mm -hmm. But that is something that we are heavily um, discussing. So um, to answer your question, we have a good mix of central and decentralized yeah. um, uh, organization including also our internal digital partner, but we see them more as partners than as, as yeah. providers. But it's not that you have a big outsourcing contract and that you've outsourced a lot to India or to wherever? No, no. Currently, this is uh, everything internally um, and also within the German Railway Group with DB Sister. Yeah. And how would you describe your role? I mean, you're the CIO and CDO. Can you describe what that means? And, and, and where you spend most of your time typically in, uh, in, on, a, on an average week? Yeah, it's a very exciting role uh -huh. that um, I have the pleasure to, to, um, yeah, to, to be part of. And for, for me, it's more like, um, I think the discussions in the past were always we need 
both a CDO and CIO. Mm-hmm. Yeah? And, and the CDO is more on the business and was doing all the cool things. And then the CIO is <laughs> like doing all the and legacy and <laughs> infrastructure yeah. and when something went wrong, right? Was, yeah. So so I, I actually like the double role because it combines uh, very much uh, business and IT really um, driving innovation, basically saying, how can we make the business better? Mm-hmm. Yeah? And at the same time, also looking how we can streamline processes. Yeah. So I spent most of my time currently really into um, looking how digitalization can help the business rather than um, how can we take care of the legacy. I mean, yes, it's a very necessary thing mm-hmm. to do and we have a very good team in place that is taken care of, but I think that is something that is also very hard to be sold to business, right? Because mm-hmm. this is not something that you can see. And, and we try here to find a good balance on, yep. on both, but my heart is more on, on the digital side and more on and really looking what does the business needs and how can we help them. Yep. And what are the main components, the main um, s- uh, platforms, let's say, that your IT strategy is built on? Mm-hmm. SAP plays an important role, I can imagine. You mentioned Salesforce yes. as a central CRM. What are the other major players? What's the, what's the cloud major cloud pr- uh, provider that you um, work with? We use uh, Amazon, mm-hmm. and that's also um, something that we, as a, as a group, are um, heavily focused on on mm-hmm. how to bring all our applications into the cloud. And I think we were one of the first, or I think even we were the first in Germany, yeah. in in that magnitude that was able to do it. And uh, that's where we are also at the same time trying to build up skills mm-hmm. on that new cloud infrastructure because all our um, staff that has been taking care or that has taken care of the um, other infrastructure before we also need to bring in right now to embrace that new technology and also what we are um, now having in the pipeline is this uh, platform where we integrate all our planning processes that's what we do with a French company called Dassault which is also one of one of the the best in terms of planning okay and and do you have a uh, a cloud first strategy or you have a cloud 100% cloud strategy what's what's your vision on that definitely cloud first mm-hmm. and but we call it more like a platform strategy and and we are still every day in the process uh, of explaining to our business what that means so mm-hmm. um, we have uh, a couple of hundred applications that we have that have just grown over the last yeah. couple of years and in my opinion, a lot of duplication there, and that's mm-hmm. uh, where we would like to minimize the amount of applications, but also um, putting them in a more flexible environment, and that's yeah. what we call cloud strategy, where in terms of platforms, um, the the ones that you mentioned, cloud, but we're also looking into low-code uh, platforms as well. Mm-hmm. Arlene, let's talk a little bit about your um, your management style. Uh, you have to manage your uh, your central team, and then you have to collaborate with, with Sistel and, and, and with, the, with, with the countries and so on. How would you describe uh, your management style uh, and what's your secret of success of building uh, successful teams? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a big fan of collaboration. I Mm -hmm. mean, when you look back into my history, then I've encountered different countries, I've encountered different cultures, different way of working. And um, I took a lot of... um, pride in this that I was able to do it but mm-hmm. I also took a lot of experience um, mm-hmm. from that and I try to apply it every day when we work in a in the multinational environment right now which yep. is very important to also um, establish relationships with our fellow countries mm-hmm. our traffic is uh, European 60% of our traffic crosses European borders so that is very important to create also a sense of belonging that mm-hmm. it's not the big holding or the big DB cargo yep. in minds that makes all the calls but also listening to them and uh, I would uh, describe myself as, as a very good and effective communicator it's, I think it's very very important especially in different cultures and also different languages to also get a sense of, of a common language yep. so that is something that uh, we put a lot of effort in and I would also say that I'm quite a nurturing um, manager mm-hmm. for me it's very important to always think of the next generation what happens if I'm not there tomorrow what happens if my leadership team is uh, not there tomorrow mm-hmm. so to really um, foster talent um, at all kinds of career stages and yep. also enable an environment where people can thrive, where, ca- where people can uh, feel appreciated and also are heard with, mm-hmm. with their ideas. Yep. Now, you are a young female digital leader with an international background. Does that make 
your life easier in a, in a traditional railway organization or is it is it an advantage or a disadvantage that you have your special background yeah it's a very interesting question i'm, I'm asked uh, uh, a lot this question and mm -hmm. i must say and i just said it uh, yesterday i was uh, um in the panel yesterday to encourage young mm -hmm. female leaders and the question was always like how is it being one of the few women where is that of a man and i said i really enjoy it yeah, <laughs> yeah because uh, my experience has been quite positive mm -hmm. like in in a very technical environment and i've spent the last 20 years of my career in technical environment mm -hmm. i never saw it some sort of a threat i always saw it somehow i can learn from my um, male colleagues and i always perceived that they were very happy to see a couple of females that yeah, i could work together with yes <laughs> so um i see it as a tremendous advantage and I can only encourage uh, to also mm -hmm. other young female leaders to yep. take a step forward and basically just try it out and, and, and see how it feels like. And sometimes it's also good. I, I love this image of a panda, yeah, to being the panda in the room. Um, one of the uh, last species that we are often described as being women in technology. So it's also an advantage <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about not only your management style, but let's also talk about your leadership style, because I think there's a difference between being a leader and being a manager. And, and so how would you describe your, your, your leadership style? And, and another way to maybe ask is, what do you think, if I go back to, uh, to the CIO office in, in, in Deutsche Bahn or go back to Volkswagen, what do you think the people that work with you today or in, in the past, how do you think they perceive you as a leader? What are they going to say about you when you're not around? Mm, to be honest, they will probably describe me as very pushy. Pushy? <laughs> pushy. Okay. That's good. <laughs> yes. Well, not always. <laughs> but pushy in a way that I, I'm an absolute driver for change. That's at least um, how I would like to be perceived. And I think mm -hmm. that's what people would always um, say about me when I'm no longer uh, there. Somebody that is really pushing the envelope, that is really looking forward, how can we improve things? Mm -hmm. um, for me, status quo is something that, that I have a really hard time with yep. um, and, and it's okay to fail, but at least uh, trying something. And that's something that I would like to also instill in the next generation of leaders that, that um, I have the privilege right now to to um, take care of mm -hmm. right now. We have about 23 teams right now. I have um, 23 managers that, that are yep. together shaping now our new IT organization and really challenging the status quo. Um, also what I think they uh, would describe me as, is, um, at least I hope so, is, is someone that at the same time uh, puts a lot of emphasis on a good um, work-life balance mm -hmm. and also for our leadership team to also tell them that it's just a job at the end of the day, mm -hmm. but it has to be uh, fun. So in order to, to have that fun, you would also need to have something outside that fulfills you because mm -hmm. the job might not be there tomorrow. And it's something that I have learned uh, at a very early stage in my career that is very, very important to have a balance, to have something outside and, and also bring that kind of um, yeah, enthusiasm um, to work, but mm -hmm. also share also sometimes in a, in a very personal note what, what drives you and what, what makes you as a person. Okay. So how do you do that? I mean, you have a very challenging job here, many different teams to lead and, and many different changes to, to accomplish. How do you manage the balance uh, uh, in, in, in your life and how do you de-stress at the end of the week? How do you fill up your batteries again? Mm -hmm. Why well, as I described before, what um, defines me is very much my family. Mm -hmm. So that keeps me uh, very, very grounded. Mm -hmm. And it's also something that I take great pleasure in. Yep. That is something that, that I really value and that gives me some sort also of uh, um, a, an energy level, but also uh, calms me down quite a bit. Like mm -hmm. um, I have a wonderful husband that I can discuss things with. He, I was lucky enough, he was a CEO before, so wow. I always tell to my management, you're lucky you got two for one. <laughs> <laughs> so that is something that, that helps me also to relax, to also bring in um, other uh, perspectives and not just within my family, but um, I do uh, a lot of networking um, mm -hmm. and that also very active yep. where I can, where I also enjoy um, exchanging with peers, what their challenges are, men and women alike. And, and that also helps me to, to find my kind of resilience. And uh, what I also enjoy uh, very much is uh, sports activities. Okay. 
um, I run frequently and that uh, is also very relaxing for me. In general, I love sports and I just love being outside and with being with other people. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about your DNA, about um, your personality, because I believe that success of a leader is very much linked to how you are um, driven as, and, as a person and what your personality is, your values are and so on. So you have shared with us that your MBTI, a personality profile, you are a protagonist, an ENFJ. And uh, that's a person with an extroverted, intuitive and feeling and judging uh, personality traits. And protagonists, um, they feel that they are called to serve a greater purpose in life. And they are thoughtful, idealistic, and these personalities, they typically strive to have a positive impact on other people uh, and the world around them. They rarely shy away from an opportunity to do the right thing. And even when doing so is far from easy. So they're very purpose-driven uh, purpose uh, people, um, people with your personality profile. Uh, Arlene, what I'm gonna g do is give you five strengths of the typical protagonist and then you tell me which one that you relate with most and maybe give an example of that and then I'll we look at the flip side as, uh, as well so typical strengths of a protagonist is that they are very receptive and they, they can listen to other people they're very reliable they do what they say and and and, and so on they're very passionate in, uh, in in their life and in their work they can be very altruistic working uh, for the uh, with purpose for the, uh, the world around them and very charismatic. Which one or ones do uh, stand out for you that you really recognize yourself in? I would say the purpose driven. Mm -hmm. That is uh, also something um, that I love every day. I know what I'm getting up for yep. working here. And that's something that resonates very well with me and that also shows um, within my career that I always took assignments where I could also make a sustainable change. Yeah, uh, because I think Typically, in, in, in a state-owned organization like DB Car Group, you, have, you can have a big impact on society. So being, uh, I think a lot of people work here because of the purpose of the company, no? Yeah, that, that's exactly uh, what uh, drives me also staying within DB Cargo mm -hmm. because I find a lot of like-minded people that are equally driven by this purpose and mm -hmm. improving um, society for the next generation. And, and I really like being in a group of um, people in a community that has that sign, sense of, uh, of uh, uh, dr drive and purpose. Okay, super. Let's look at the flip side of your personality uh, type potential weaknesses or development areas of the protagonist is that sometimes they can be unrealistic, uh, expecting too much. They can be overly idealistic. They can be condescending in the sense that they like to explain things and they know how things are, but they can sometimes do it in a condescending way. They can be too intense and they can also be overly empathetic. Which one in the past where you recognize yourself, in which areas uh, have you developed yourself to come o overcome some of these uh, or one or, or a couple of these uh, weaknesses? I would say condescending yes. <laughs> <laughs> right now, but I think I improved over the years. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's definitely one of my weaknesses. I think I'm very often very fast in, in my judgment and mm -hmm. then very often also fast in sizing people up that I may not be as fast as I am. And yeah. I was so many times and I learned it the hard way that uh, that's not the best way of, of uh, trying to achieve a common goal. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that I've definitely worked on over the last couple of years to um, step back, mm -hmm. listen to the other person, see what the perspective is and also letting the person develop their ideas and their actions in their time, not in my timeline. Yeah. So you have learned to be to be more patient and to be less intense now and then. I uh, hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's dive one level deeper, uh, Arlene, and let's uh, let's talk about your core values because I think that's really what drives uh, a person in the end. So you have two children, two daughters, fifteen and seventeen. Uh, 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 you told us. What are the the values that you have passed on to them, and can you give an example of of what you expect from them and, and how you want them and therefore yourself to behave and, and, and the core values that drive you in your life? Mm -hmm. I think there, there are three values that we um, 
give them every day and we remind them how important they are. And it's, mm -hmm. First of all, it's being generous. Mm -hmm. Generous in the way of um, sharing their experience, but also being out there and also letting people in their lives. You know, we have moved around so oh, many times. Yeah. And at the same time, our children, even though they may complain today that they don't have a home everywhere, I think they do have homes everywhere because we have people that we know in Toronto, New York, Manila. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's for them, it's, it's, it's uh, I think, a, a great way also of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think it's very important for them to also realize uh, how much luck they had yep. and also the generosity giving that some sort of back. The second, um, I think it's being flexible because life is always changing. I think they learned it at a very young age because they also moved around yeah. with us in so many different places. And the last one is, and, and I hope they will carry that within themselves, is being courageous, not being afraid of trying out new things and just doing things. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't matter what people are saying yep. and staying their own person um, during their journey. Okay. You, if you look back at your uh, career, which is now, what is it, just over 20 years? 20 years, yeah. Um, what are the, 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 the important people, the mentors that have shaped you as a professional and maybe helped in your career as well, people that you look up to and that you learn from? Can you maybe give an example of that? Yeah, I was lucky enough early on, I think he was my second boss that I had, an American, mm -hmm. and I just loved the way he um, was uh, living his life. So he was living um, in uh, close to the Jersey Shores mm -hmm. in the US, uh, right by the beach, and he could see the ocean. And it was very often that when we had meetings, he basically said, Arlene, is it okay? The waves are great. Can I go out for a surf now? I'm gonna come in later. And I kind of liked that because it was very much already this result-oriented mm -hmm. uh, working behavior, but at the same time also saying, enjoy life. I seize the, seize the moment, carpe diem, yeah. seize the opportunity. Uh, so that I really liked. And, and the second uh, characteristic, and that's something that I still carry with me today is what he said was, um, look, Arlene, career is important. Look at myself. Um, my daughters are now 15 and 17, same age, like our daughters today. And they don't want to spend time with me anymore. And they're still telling, telling me today, you were not there. Because, and that's what he said, Arlene, I was focused too much on my career. Yep. And in the blink of an eye, they were grown up and, and don't miss that opportunity. Yep. Find a good balance. I know you're very career driven, but that doesn't mean that you have to choose for one or the other. Yep. And that's something that I was carrying all the time with me. And uh, I hope that our daughters will tell that later also that I was there during the important moments and yep. also being a good role model to them that you can have both. You know? So tell us the big secret then, uh, Arlene, you have lived in in Singapore and in, 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 in uh, the Philippines and Canada and the US and, and Spain and what was it in Buenos Aires and all around the world and in Germany and, and, and so on. So, so many different places. What is the best place in the world to live? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> I love New York, I must say. Okay. I love New York. Uh -huh. yeah, that's still one of my favorite cities because it's vibrant, it's very multicultural, it's uh, always something new in there. And yeah, to me, that's still one of my dream cities. Okay, super. You have built quite a career. Huh? Let's, let's be honest, you're very, very successful, um, but we all make our mistakes, right? So my favorite questions, one of the favorite questions in this uh, interview is, is Arlene, would you please care to share what was your most brilliant failure and what did you learn from it? I must say, and it still pains me, it was actually the entrepreneurial road that we okay. took. I mean, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur and had this dream. Remember, as I had this story when I was 16, I got my laptop and then mm -hmm. we had this dot-com boom and I said, oh, I can be one of them. <laughs> And so the dream was always to become an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. when um, our first daughter was born, we moved to the Philippines and we just did that. But what we did was, and we were both IT people, we basically said, oh, we don't want to do IT. We just want to do something we, and we can do it. So we built furniture, outdoor furniture. Ah. And we miserably failed <laughs> because we built a furniture that we thought were cool, outdoor furniture, mm -hmm. but nobody else thought they were cool. So my lessons learned was stick to your core competency. 
I mean, entrepreneurship is super, but stick to your core competency and don't venture out in the field that you know nothing about and we learn it really the hard way. Yeah. It was still fun, yeah. but I wouldn't uh, recommend it to anybody. And make sure that if you develop something, that is something that the market is waiting for. Exactly. Right? <laughs> that was also like, yeah. um, be very customer centric. Yeah. So Arlene, do you have a personal mantra saying that helps you in your daily life? My personal mantra is carpe diem seize the day. And what do I mean by this? I start the day every day knowing it could be my last. Mm -hmm. And I end the day every day and ask myself, was it a good day? Have you done something different? Have you learned something new? Have you made an impact? Mm -hmm. And that's something that defines me very much to focus on the important things. In my case, it's career and family, mm -hmm. but at the same time also making an impact and also um, influencing in a positive way uh, yeah. people's lives. So Arlene, besides, of course, family, which is very important for you, what would you say is really the best thing that has ever happened to you in your life? It was definitely my travels. Mm -hmm. I was able to travel quite a lot in, in the world and met um, a lot of interesting people. And from that, what, what sticks out is Buenos Aires. I mm -hmm. was uh, two months in, in Buenos Aires. I wanted to learn Spanish and, and, and I didn't want to do it like the classical way, let's go to Spain and do it. And then did some research and then found um, this language school in Buenos Aires was a very nice Argentinian teacher. And I did that for the two months. And at that time it, I was completely on my own. It was in my early twenties. And the moment I arrived, I was like, oh my God, I don't really know how to speak <laughs> Spanish, but it forced me mm -hmm to learn it uh, quickly in two months it was only basics, but at yep. least uh, that was something that, that I really treasure. And it was something um, that uh, I also recommend um, other people to sometimes just make the step and, and um, maybe just jump into the cold water, get your feet wet and, and see what comes out of it. And it was a, a really interesting time, challenging time also, but it was yep. very interesting just being on my own there and discovering um, the culture there and obviously also learning a little bit of, of Spanish. <laughs> So, Arlene, in your life, what is it that you would say you fear most and what is it that you love most? What I fear most is uh, that uh, I get sick or uh, some of my um, family members get mm -hmm. sick. My husband is uh, over 60, so there's definitely a possibility that something might happen mm -hmm. uh, to him. So that's something that I would really fear most because He's not only my best friend and husband, but also very much my uh, professional advisor, my oh, yeah. coach, yes. And what do you love most in your life? My family, I have to say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Okay, good. Arlene, thank you so much for your hospitality here today in Mainz. It was really a pleasure having this uh, leadership deep dive interview with you. Uh, so thank you for sharing uh, everything. But before we end it, um, I want to uh, give you my last question for today. And that is these videos are being watched um, not only by other CIOs and digital leaders, but also by ambitious young professionals that want to follow in your footsteps. So what's the advice that you would give to these, uh, to these young people? Just do it. If an opportunity presents itself, don't think about it. Just do it. Always think what your goal is. If you want to become a CIO, it means hard work. It also means some side roads, but stay focused, take the next step. Just do, do it. Take every opportunity that presents uh, itself to you and you will reach your goal. Okay. And on that note, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Thank you very much. It thank was you. a pleasure.